Okay, good morning. Welcome to the second day. So we're going to kick this off with uh, Neil Kleiman. Neil is a preeminent interventional cardiologist. He is the head of our cat lab and he leads our TAVR team and has been heavily involved in a lot of the advanced imaging. So Neil's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with us. Thank you, Neil. Well, thanks, Alan. Uh, so listen, just before I got here this morning, the fire marshal called me. And he said, look, you know, there's a problem with the room. There are too many people sitting in the back. <laughs> so um, I've noticed there are a few empty seats in the front. Uh, Charles, Iris, Leo, grab those people around you. Move them up front. I mean, how are you going to see this stuff from the back? Come on. Really? Look, look at all these empty seats. OK, so. Um, I'm going to talk to you for the next 90 minutes about imaging for TAVR, mitral valve, and paravalvular plugs. OK, so first of all, my view is that uh, this is an imaging symposium. Our job as providers, operators, interventionalists, whatever you want to call us, is to push the limits, to identify where the boundaries are, and to make sure we step just across them. The job of the imagers are to let us know where those lines are and make sure we don't go too far. So as I see it, our job is to put devices in patients. The job of the imager is to keep us out of trouble. I, I honestly think so. With some of the devices that are now fairly forgiving, we want to know what are the limits of forgiveness. So there are things that uh, we're very, very dependent on imaging. These are the things that we try to avoid. Paravalvular leaks, uh, damage to the aortic root, which is uniformly fatal, avulsion of the iliac, which uh, is fatal a little bit less than you think, but it's, it's a near-death experience for the operator. LV outflow tract obstruction, which is catastrophic, device embolization, and coronary artery occlusion, which in itself carries a 50% mortality. So as we're imaging, uh, for TAVR, and let's start with TAVR because it's the most straightforward uh, of the procedures I'm going to talk about. These are the things we really need to know. Aortic annular dimensions, sinus of valsalva diameter, that is how big is the area where we're going to try to put this valve. We want to make it sit tightly. We don't want space around it, but we do want space in the sinuses of valsalva so blood can get into the coronary arteries. The heart sort of likes that height of the coronary ostea, diameter of the sinotubular junction, and dimensions, tortuosity, and calcification of the iliacs. So let me just show you one, one of the things that we uh, very much try to avoid. This is coronary artery occlusion. And, uh, can we make these loop, uh, AV guys? Yeah. So if you take a look on your left, there's a uh, a valve we implanted inside uh, a stentless valve. So this is a valve and valve procedure in a pretty frail patient. Um, I don't really know why it's not looping, but what I'm hoping for you to see is if you look at the cage, the, the large stent there, and you look down at the bottom towards the right and the left, there's very a very small amount of clearance around the valve. That's the laser if you want. Oh, OK. Thanks. So s small sinuses of Valsalva here. This valve went in successfully, looked great. We high-fived ourselves. And then 30 minutes later, the patient arrested on the table. The patient was resuscitated. Uh, we did some quick checks for a variety of catastrophic things that were sort of programmed to look for. Bottom line is the left coronary artery was occluded. Fortunately. Uh, this patient could be resuscitated. Uh, as you can see, there's a uh, vein bypass graft to a circumflex. And if you look carefully at the tail end of the cine angiogram on your right, you'll see there's retrograde filling of the entire left system. This is because there's no longer flow antegrade through the left main coronary artery. So this patient arrested for that reason. This is what we try to avoid. Most patients can't be resuscitated when this happens. If you're lucky, you can get a stent in real fast. Uh, unless you anticipate it, again, based on dimensions you get from the CT scan, 
and actually park an undeployed stent there to inflate really quick, you're not going to be able to get in again, and it's usually a, an absolutely catastrophic situation. Here's another principle. We live and die by this principle. This is the relationship between sizing of the uh, valve and sizing of the aortic annulus. Uh, and it's the relationship between the degree of oversizing and the degree of paravalvular leak. Paravalvular leak is what we try very, very hard to avoid. We underestimate it. We always say, great job, there's no leak here. That's usually bullshit. Uh, you, you hear it on, when you're in the audience, you hear someone on the podium says, oh, that you've done a wonderful job, sitting back there in the back like you're not supposed to. And you say, what are these guys thinking? We don't like paravalvular leaks, and it's very clear in the literature, very clear in our experience, uh, this 100% sink. The greater the size of the valve relative to the annulus, the more snugly it fits, like everything else in life. Uh, these, this is probably the most clear set of data. This is from the uh, Evolute R data set, and clearly as the device misspelled to annular sizing ratio increases, the risk of having a moderate or severe leak decreases pretty dramatically. So we go to all lengths to avoid this. So we've sort of adopted a sizing algorithm. Are the coronaries high enough to do the case at all? Is the annulus small enough? And I'll show you an example in a minute. Are the sinuses of Valsalva and the sinotubular junction large enough? And finally, how much calcium sitting in the left ventricular outflow tract? We haven't yet formalized uh, a way to get something useful out of the calcium distribution. That's going to happen. So how do we measure the annulus? Well, there are a variety of ways to do it. This is uh, the Siemens program that lets us do it. And uh, to make a long story short, the aorta is segmented, as shown over here. We then get three planes. Uh, we look at the, uh, at the transverse plane, rotate it around make sure that in the other two planes, we are cutting just at the very base of the annulus. This is a structure that doesn't really exist, but if you were to connect the uh, basal portions of all three sinuses of Valsalva, you'd have three points that would mathematically define a plane. That's what we take as our annular plane. So we're very, 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 very dependent on this image shown here. So this is, a, uh, this is an average sized patient, maybe a little on the big side, uh, who underwent a CT scan in preparation for Tavor. And we take this during peak systole. So gate, on a gated scan, it's about 30 or 40% uh, into the cardiac cycle. And you can see uh, we look very hard to make sure that we're right at, or perhaps even just below the annular plane. Once we do that, we take this image, we planimeter the image, we're never sure exactly what to do with the calcium. Do you go inside the calcium or outside the calcium, thinking how the valve will expand? You know, like most, most of the time when we don't know, we cut it down the middle and we'll planimeter, planimeter around here. Then we'll scroll up a few millimeters, cut through the sinuses of Valsalva, and again in the transverse plane. We'll measure each sinus. And then, you know, as Einstein said, there's a reason they make phone books. We don't memorize what'll fit where. There's a chart. We hang on the wall, we look at the annular size, the sinus of Valsalva size, see which valve's gonna fit in there. Well, that's all well and good. And again, we try to identify that line, go just above it so we have a nice snug fit with the valve. But let me show you another patient who's under consideration. This guy. So what about this guy? Well, he's a big dude. Um, and we live in 2017. And when we talk about imaging in 2017, we talk about image quality and we talk about dose reduction in radiation. So this guy, who's bed bound, had a reduced skin dose. Uh, the result? is we have a reduced image. So this is the downside of something that's very important to us. Now, if you think about it, 
Uh, this guy is morbidly obese, he's bed bound. Uh, carcinogenesis is not an issue in this guy. This guy's not got a long-term horizon. So if he gets a little bit more radiation than you know a younger person would, you're probably not gonna see a difference. We're not talking about deterministic effects here. He's not gonna get a skin burn from his CT. But this is a problem. And the reason it's a really serious problem is uh, remember when I showed you how we determine the annular plane, I've got no idea where that plane is. I don't know how low to go to make the cuts. So as I enlarge the image in the uh, upper left quadrant, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I don't know where the margins are. So this is one cut, and uh, as we plenum and it, we get 102 millimeter perimeter. This is much too big for any valve mate. If you try to put a valve in this guy, it's going to be catastrophic. He's going to have a tremendous paravalvular leak. He's not going to like it. If I choose the plane a little bit differently, I get, you know, in one cut it was 96, and this cut it was 97.7. That's really stretching the, the limit, the upper limits of a uh, core valve. We probably could do this if this is correct. If the other number is not correct, we can't. So uh, dosage modulation is important in many circumstances. Uh, in other circumstances, it really becomes a secondary consideration. Let me take you through another case. So this is a guy we uh, just saw, 75 years old. Uh, several years ago, he had a surgical AVR for aortic stenosis. Uh, 23 millimeter bioprosthetic valve. Uh, the bottom line is he now comes in with dyspnea in about four months of uh, shortness of breath, and he's got aortic regurgitation. He has a spinal nerve stimulator implanted in 2000. That's important when we wanted to uh, quantitate and visualize the AR uh, by MRI, that became a non issue. Uh, couldn't be done at least couldn't be done safely. So I'm glad to see uh, Steve Little is absent today. So if I chose the wrong echo cut, I'm off the hook. Um, but bottom line is when you look at this, uh, there's aortic regurgitation. It looks like there are two jets on his transthoracic. Um, here are two cuts from his TEE. So we knew he had a leak. Couldn't tell if it was paravalvular or valvular. The treatments are different. So we did a transesophageal echo. And there's still some question as to whether there are two jets that are paravalvular or one central jet. And that makes a big difference. So there's serious decision making as we try to set this fellow up for a procedure. And why is that? Well, the treatments are very different. And uh, while if you choose the wrong treatment, and don't get the guy better, you can still perform the other treatment, but it becomes much, much more difficult. If he's got a paravalvular leak, that is a space between the valve and the native annulus, well, then you treat it by uh, implanting a plug that looks like one of these two things at the bottom. If he's got a central leak, meaning the leaflets are malfunctioning, then you put another valve in. Well, if you do one, why can't you do the other? Well, you can, but now if you have two valves in and you then learn it's a paravalvular leak, you've got two frameworks to work your catheter between. So you've got a double layer of stent to get a catheter behind and in the right spots so you can deploy a plug. Or if you deploy a plug in the paravalvular position and then realize, well, this isn't really it, it's a central leak, now you've got to try to expand another valve and you've got this plug protruding into the space we want to expand. So you really want to get this right. It's not uh, irretrievable, but it's really pain, and you're not going to come out with a good result if you make the wrong decision. So um, our first look at the CT uh, left some question as to whether there was a space between the valve and the annulus. Uh, one of the members of the audience who had the good taste to sit up front, sitting right there, reconstructed it for us. And in fact, if you look really carefully, you see that, the, uh, that there is no gap 
visible. There's no contrast showing up between the valve and the native annulus. So uh, in fact, we took a deep breath and said, aha, this is a central valvular problem. Uh, we did a valve in valve implantation in this guy. If you look on your left, is the pre-implantation angiogram. That's done with 20 mils of dilute contrast. You can see contrast just uh, dashing into the ventricle. If you look at your right post-implant, that's now 45 mils of full strength contrast, and there's only a very tiny amount of contrast getting into the ventricle. So we did it right. I think we were 90% skilled, 10% lucky on this one. Uh, I've got four seconds remaining. I wanted to switch valves. Just to tell you, the mitral valve makes the aortic valve look easy. It's, and I highlighted the words here, it's asymmetric, it's saddle-shaped, it's dynamic, all the things that make it really tough to image. Uh, it's easy to block aortic outflow and uh, put a mitral valve in position that's obstructing the LV outflow tract. It's easier to clot, and the annulus changes sizes as the heart dilates. So let me make a long story short. Uh, take a look. This is a CT scan of a heart with a valve superimposed upon it. And what you can see, uh, really simply, is we've got to worry about annular fit, but we've also got to worry about this structure. This is the aorta. Here's the aortic valve. Here's what we call the LV outflow tract. See how that valve sits down and blocks the LV outflow tract? Well, that becomes an issue. Uh, we have to model it very carefully. There's a lot of selection and planning that goes into uh, choosing these patients so that, we, uh, so that we don't obstruct the LV outflow tract. I'm a minute over. I'm not going to go any further, uh, but thanks very much. Do you do valvuloplasty with both of these, with the, both the sapien valve and the core valve, or just with the core valve? With, with both. So, and, and it, so, so you don't, there's no factoring in the effect of the valvuloplasty on valve sizing. You're committed to that before the valvuloplasty. Yeah, you're committed by the, by the annular plane. Okay. And how big this. There's a lot of controversy and, as to whether you should or not. Uh, our leaning is very much that you should, and you should do it aggressively, but a lot of people don't. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.